This video is supported by Brilliant. In 1987, the nations of the world gathered in Montreal, Quebec to sign an international environmental agreement that came to be known as the Montreal Protocol. On January 1st, 1989, the treaty went into effect, and to date, 189 UN members follow its provisions as international law. The problem this set out to fix, as many of you already know, is the hole in the ozone layer. And while the ozone hole isn't completely fixed, it is well on its way. Unlike climate change, where every report seems to show everything going in the wrong direction, this one is actually getting better, and it's on track to be completely healed. We actually got this one right. I know, right? Good news? Feels so weird. Many people consider the Montreal Protocol to be one of the most successful international agreements of all time. But why? Why did this one succeed where so many other climate agreements didn't? And what can we learn from it? So you've probably heard about the ozone hole and know it has something to do with hairspray or something, but maybe you don't know exactly what caused it or why. So let's start there and talk about what caused this problem in the first place. And for that, we gotta talk about CFCs. Christian fundamentalist churches? N no. Cold fructose containers? Uh, no. Cosmic fractal contaminants? What, what is, what is, what is that? Canadian fried cactus? I don't think that's a thing. Catastrophic foot cancer? Okay, no, that's, that's not, that's not funny. California fart controllers? Chlorof it, it's chlorofluorocarbons. Chlorofluorocarbons? What's that? Well, let me tell you. Like a lot of things that we create as humans, PLASTIC! Um, CFCs were a great thing until they sort of became a terrible thing. In the 1920s and 30s, refrigerators started becoming widespread, and they were a bit of a godsend at first. I mean, before refrigerators, people had to use insulated ice boxes to preserve their food, and they had to get ice from these people that delivered it to their house. There was this entire industry around it. It's actually pretty fascinating. It's one of those industries that completely went away because of technology, you know? But yeah, once the fridge was invented, all you had to do was just plug it in and you're good to go. So yeah, they were super popular and everybody loved them. Except of course the people at the ice companies. These newfangled refrigerators did have one downside though. And that's the fact that they use methyl chloride as a refrigerant. And the problem with methyl chloride is it'll kind of, sort of, a little bit, but 100% totally kill you. So if your refrigerator happened to spring a leak, you died. Morbid humor aside, this did actually happen a lot, and dozens of people were killed by their refrigerators. One infamous case was the 1929 death of the entire Painter family in Chicago. Enter Thomas Midgley Jr. of General Motors, who was the first person who invented a way to use CFCs as a refrigerant. I should note that he didn't invent CFCs. They had been around for a while, but he did find some new applications for it, and he did figure out a way to help produce it more cheaply at scale. By the way, Midgley is responsible for another environmental catastrophe because he's the guy who put lead in gasoline. He discovered that adding tetraethyl lead or TEL to gasoline would help prevent engines from knocking. The problem was the lead part. Yeah, lead is highly toxic and can cause a host of health problems, including memory loss and lowered IQ. But that was put in gasoline and people breathe that in for 50 years. But finally, researchers were able to tie low test scores with higher concentrations of lead in school children, and finally it started to get phased out. And some have actually pointed out that crime rates went down in the United States after they phased out lead in gasoline. Now that might be more of a correlation than a causation kind of thing, but still. So yeah, when you combine the lead and the gasoline thing and the CFCs, it's been said that no one single human being has done more harm to the environment than Thomas Midgley Jr. But back to CFCs, they did solve the refrigerator killing people problem, but they also seem to solve a lot of other problems too. They started adding it to air conditioning units and fire extinguishers, and since it was completely non-toxic, it became kind of the go-to propellant in practically every household product that used compressed air. Hairspray is a classic example, but they were also used to blow bubbles into styrofoam and as foaming agents and insulation. They were even used in medical inhalers. So for a while there, life was pretty sweet for CFC manufacturers until an article came out in the journal Nature in 1974. It was written by Mario Molina and Frank Sherwood Rowland, who went by Sherry Rowland. Sherry, by the way, had an amazing pedigree. He was actually a student of no less than five Nobel laureates at the University of Chicago, including Walter Libby, who invented carbon-14 dating, and Enrico Fermi. He and Molina had been running tests on CFCs for a few years and came to some pretty disturbing findings. Basically, CFC molecules react with light and release a chlorine atom. To explain why that's a big deal, here comes the chemistry. 
Okay, so this is ozone, O3, three oxygen atoms bonded together. When ozone and chlorine mix, it creates a reaction that strips an oxygen atom from the ozone, forming hypochlorite and oxygen O2. But in the atmosphere, hypochlorite doesn't stick around for long. It's a weak bond and breaks apart pretty easily, which frees that chlorine up to bust up another ozone molecule, and this happens over and over and over and over again. So a single chlorine atom can smash its way through a lot of ozone. And by that, I mean like 100,000 molecules. Yeah, you know those videos of those giant Asian hornets just running through a whole hive of honeybees? It's basically chlorine with ozone. So in their article, Roland and Molina warned that this chain reaction could possibly deplete the ozone layer. So let's talk about the ozone layer for a second. The ozone layer wraps around the entire planet. It starts low in the stratosphere and reaches high above, but the peak concentrations are between 30 and 35 kilometers. And the concentration of this layer actually does vary naturally over time. Uh, it's actually part of a whole cycle of reactions between oxygen and sunlight. This is called the Chapman cycle. And the way it works is light in the upper atmosphere knocks electrons off of oxygen atoms. This creates a positively charged ion that then sticks to an O2 molecule creating ozone, O3. And if another positively charged oxygen ion comes colliding into that O3, it can break it apart into two O2 molecules, which can then get split apart by light, and the process repeats itself. And this has been going on for millions of years. And the reason this matters is because of that wavelength of light that I keep referring to that gets absorbed by these oxygen atoms and fueling this cycle is mostly ultraviolet light. This is how the ozone layer absorbs UV rays. And yeah, UV light is bad. Not only can it lead to cataracts and skin cancer in humans and in animals, but excess UV can actually impair photosynthesis in plants and kill bacteria. In fact, according to NASA, if it wasn't for this atmospheric ozone, unchecked UV would, quote, sterilize the Earth's surface. That would be bad. So yeah, a massive injection of chlorine hornets chewing through the ozone layer is a big deal. Now it should be pointed out, chlorine is a, a natural element. It occurs naturally in nature. It's created by tropical vegetation, uh, forest fires, even some oceanic processes. But chlorine molecules usually break down before they reach the upper atmosphere. CFC molecules don't. They're actually very stable. So yeah, CFC molecules are basically just like murder hornet delivery systems, just driving the chlorine up into the upper atmosphere where the light hits the CFC, releases the chlorine. Yeah, and all hell breaks loose. So Roland and Molina's paper came out in 1974. Again, this was just sort of speculating that this could be a problem someday. It would be about a decade before scientists at the British Antarctic Survey discovered the ozone hole. It was actually a physicist named Jonathan Shanklin who made the find. He actually had to dig back through some historical data for comparison. But yeah, he found out that the ozone over the Antarctic had thinned out by a third. Now concentrations do change naturally, as I mentioned, but uh, this decline had been going on for several years. And while it is a worldwide problem, it's thinnest over the South Pole. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, I'll put some links down in the description. It's way too much to go into here, but basically it has to do with the wind currents and atmospheric conditions, the low temperatures and whatnot. It just kind of creates unique conditions for stratospheric clouds over Antarctica. And these stratospheric clouds make the CFCs a lot more volatile there. But anyway, the hole had been found. Shanklin authored a paper about it and it was published in the journal Nature. And panic set in. Because this wasn't just an isolated report. People had been concerned about ozone depletion for a while. There was that paper from Roland and Molina. Other people had been studying it. And uh, this is kind of interesting. One of the things that people were most concerned about were Concorde jets. Yeah, the Concords actually flew up into the stratosphere much higher than uh, normal jets. And, and they produced a lot of emissions just like normal jets. But the fact that these emissions are going directly into the ozone layer did have some people concerned. It wasn't really a factor though, because there were so few Concords. But no, there had been calls for regulation of CFCs by scientists, including Sherry Rowland. Uh, but it was of course opposed by CFC manufacturers like DuPont, probably because they were making tons of money on it but we'll never know for sure. So regulation had been stymied for years, but uh, yeah, everything changed once they saw the hole. <laughs> but yeah, right after Shanklin's paper hit the shelves in May, 1985, NASA was able to actually image the hole using satellite data. And within 18 months, UN members had met, authored, and signed the Montreal Protocol. Now I should point out that there had been a previous convention on this issue back in March of 85, uh, this one was actually called the Vienna Convention. But this one didn't really have any teeth. Um, it wasn't really regulatory in nature. It was just about countries agreeing to share knowledge with each other. Uh, but then it became completely irrelevant literally two months later when NASA was able to produce these images. So, you know, 
They had all the knowledge they needed. But unlike the Vienna Convention, the protocol required signatories to actually restrict CFCs. They were able to do so gradually. Um, in fact, it allowed a little bit of a grace period where CFC production and consumption was actually allowed to increase. Because it had become so ubiquitous and so many things that were already on the market, they had to kind of wait for that momentum to wane, and uh, they also needed replacements to be found. And originally that replacement was hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or HCFCs, uh, which are obviously chemically similar to CFCs, but they decay quickly, so they don't actually reach the stratosphere. But they are also an extremely potent greenhouse gas, because we can't have anything nice. So for that reason, they too were later outlawed in an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Uh, developed nations phase it out by 2020, developing nations have until 2030. Now another alternative was hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, and yeah, I know, you're, you're gonna hear a lot of acronyms with the same letters over and over. And these were later phased out for the same reason as the HCFCs, they're greenhouse gases. And yeah, the replacing of CFCs with truly green alternatives is still an ongoing process. Many refrigerators and air conditioners still use HFCs, but natural gas refrigerants are becoming more popular. The particular natural gas is called isobutane. Uh, it doesn't deplete ozone and it has a low potential for global warming. It goes by R600A in refrigerators. It's categorized generally recognized as safe by the FDA, so it's used as a propellant in a lot of cosmetic products, uh, but it is a natural gas and it's subject to whims of the energy industry. Now another synthetic alternative is called hydrofluorolefins, or HFOs. Now, studies say that HFOs should be safe for the environment. They do break down pretty quickly and have a low potential for global warming. Although production of it does release significant amounts of CO2, um, I feel like that can be said for pretty much everything these days though. There are also concerns about a type of acid that forms when HFOs decompose in the atmosphere. Some studies say that these acids are harmless. Others point out that we really don't know what kind of effects a high concentration of it could have. After all, unintended consequences are kind of what got us here in the first place. But I don't think there's really any reason to worry. The company that produces HFOs is called Chemours, uh, which is a division of DuPont. And they were such heroes in the ozone fight that their CEO was given the National Medal of Technology by George W. Bush in 2003. They actually formed a lobbying group denying the science for years after the Montreal Protocol before finally turning on their heels when the bans went into effect and positioned themselves as the main supplier of CFC alternatives and made massive profits from the crisis. Things aren't getting better. Between 1979 and 1987, the ozone hole grew from 1.1 million square kilometers to 22.5 million square kilometers. And it's fluctuated since, but it has generally declined. And the World Meteorological Organization predicts a full recovery to pre-CFC levels by the end of this century. And that's in Antarctica. People forget that ozone levels are actually down worldwide. It's not just that it's at the bottom of the planet. But the good news is that the rest of the world is recovering even faster. They predict that the Northern Hemisphere should recover by the 2030s and the Southern Hemisphere by the 2050s. But this isn't all just from that original Montreal Protocol. There have been a number of amendments over the years, including the London Amendment in 1990, the Copenhagen Amendment in 1992, the Vienna Accord in 1995, the Montreal Amendment in 1997, the Beijing Amendment in 1999, and most recently the Kigali Amendment in 2016, which cut AFC consumption by 80%. Now, if Kigali had been an amendment to any other climate agreement, I'd probably just roll my eyes. But, given the Montreal Protocol's record, I'm optimistic. Which begs the original question, how come the Montreal Protocol was so successful when so many other climate agreements have failed? So the two biggest climate change agreements were the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Both of these were UN-sponsored attempts at kind of uniting the world against climate change. Kyoto has been called a fiasco. The world's biggest polluters, including the US and China, refused to even participate, and several countries that did participate totally failed to meet their CO2 reduction goals. The Paris Agreement is kind of a work in progress, but like Kyoto, none of its agreements are legally binding, so it's kind of hard to imagine it's going to do any better. Oh, it should be mentioned that many of the ozone-threatening chemicals banned by the Montreal Protocol over the years also just happen to be powerful greenhouse gases. So some have made the argument that it's actually had a greater direct impact on climate change than Paris and Kyoto. So one key difference between those climate agreements and the Montreal Protocol is just simply buy-in. Like the US and other developed nations had the most to lose from gaining CFCs, but they backed Montreal to the hilt. 
Now granted, this was after years of debating the science, but science has been warning about climate change for decades before we knew anything about what CFCs were doing. So why have we moved so slowly on climate change when we move so quickly on the ozone layer? Part of the reason might have just been the imminent threat of the ozone problem. I mean, remember the ozone hole grew by a factor of 20 in only eight years. That makes it pretty easy to get the message across, not to mention it's a friggin' hole. Like you can see it, it's getting bigger. And it's a very immediate threat, you know? It's not some, some vague threat about rising sea levels someday. It's not some statistical thing to wonk over. No, it's, if we don't fix this, I can't go outside. Also, the substances that need to be controlled for climate change are far more embedded into our economies than the, you know, refrigerants that were damaging the ozone layer. So it is a different problem, and it's, it's far more complicated. But what can we learn from the Montreal Protocol? One is that any climate agreement that doesn't have any teeth to it is really more of a climate suggestion. The Montreal Protocol did a great job of sort of threading the needle between respecting each nation's sovereignty while holding them accountable for meeting their goals. While other climate agreements like Paris and Kyoto have been criticized for not pushing hard on the accountability side. The other lesson is that it's just as important to have a good alternative to the bad thing you're banning as it is to just ban the bad thing. Like DuPont made billions of dollars making alternatives to fix the problem that they helped cause in the first place. Kind of gross, but it worked. Perhaps with more incentives, fossil fuel companies could conjure up greener fuel alternatives. Maybe give them a medal. For the record, I'm not saying I like this idea, but if it works, it works. But maybe the biggest takeaway from the Montreal Protocol is that, yes, this can be done. We are capable of working together globally to tackle big existential problems. It's been done. And we can do it again. And with that comes a measure of hope, which is perhaps the most valuable resource in the world right now. By the way, if all this talk about chlorofluorohydrotopochico makes your head spin as much as mine does, you might want to check out the chemical reaction course on Brilliant. Through 15 interactive lessons covering 180 exercises, this course will teach you everything from acids to bases to moles and Avogadro's number, reaction energetics, stoichiometry, and more. And if all that stuff sounds over your head, don't worry, it won't be. Because Brilliant uses visual and interactive lessons to teach you by solving problems, which is something that we all know how to do on a certain level. It kind of hacks this innate problem-solving ability and uses it to teach fundamental concepts that you can then build upon until the next thing you know, you're doing advanced math and science that you always thought was out of your reach. It's a great gift for kids who are struggling to learn in the traditional school setting, or if you're an adult and you just always wish you had a better handle on this, well, here's your chance. It's not too late. So if you've been on the fence about Brilliant, you can try the first few lessons of any course for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. And if you like it and you want to know more, you can sign up for the premium subscription and get 20% off. This does only apply for the first 200 people though, so get off your butt and do it. So once again, that's brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are forming an awesome community, uh, keeping the lights on around here and just being a great resource for me. I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, there's a handful of new people to shout out real quick. We've got Safety Memos on Foreheads, Paris in Stereo, Ricardo Ponce, Colin Stone, and Mr. McGruff. Mr. McGruff. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them and get early access to videos, uh, access to exclusive live streams and other good stuff, and just be part of an awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, maybe check this one out, because Google thinks you'll like that one, or check out any of the others down here on the side that got my face on them, and if you enjoy them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.